but we have been anticipating the filing of a motion for a new trial, a filing for a motion for acquittal. Uh, and now the day has come. The motions have been filed. We've all had a chance to read them. Uh, so I want to start with you, Mansfield. What sticks out to you in, let's start with the motion for acquittal, because I think that's where the real meat is. Uh, what stands out uh, for you in that motion? How well it is written and how it is establishing flaws in the prosecution's case. Um, testimony that was given by the prosecution star witness that was um, false gave false testimony uh, after being sworn to tell the truth. And it's no holds barred in terms of establishing a very, very negative um, assessment of prosecutorial uh, misconduct by the U.S. attorneys prosecuting the case. Um, basically, this document will establish that this conviction needs to be set aside or the motion for acquittal, uh, notwithstanding the conviction needs to be granted. How likely is it that it will be? Uh, probably not likely, but they have all of the evidence. The defense team for Mark Ridley Thomas has put together a, a resoundingly strong document for uh, the uh, judgment of conviction to be set aside. It's very strong. And it's, I would tell your listeners to, <laughs> to be in the courtroom on June 26 at 8.30 a.m. because that will be a moment to, um, to really see how the prosecution squirms out of this one. Um, so, Ariva, it is not uncommon in many criminal cases, both state and federal, for prosecutors to make mistakes in terms of both present the presenting of evidence and in close, um, <clears throat> closing argument opening argument, oftentimes, and, and Mansfield will probably co-sign on this, and, and Dion also, oftentimes uh, the judge will find that the error was harmless. Uh, in this case, uh, the judge is going to have to take a much harder look because some of the things that they're talking about, which you alluded to earlier in your kind of opening comments, was that they improperly vouched for, or at least they're alleging, that the prosecutors improperly vouched for a star witness, in this case, the FBI agent, kind of supporting him or propping him up in terms of uh, things that that witness said on the stand, which a prosecutor can't do. The prosecutor's opinion of the witness's uh, testimony is irrelevant, and the jurors are told that they're supposed to not listen to that. Um, but again, uh, oftentimes, prosecutors do make mistakes in this vein, and and more uh, than likely, a judge would find that their error was harmless. Well, let's talk about the big elephant in the room, Dion, and that's the allegation that the star witness gave false testimony. I have to imagine, Bobby, that now we're getting into a really dangerous territory when you start talking about an FBI agent star witness for the prosecution, giving false testimonies. Dion, you were in that courtroom. You saw that FBI agent. You heard him. You saw him. You witnessed his testimony. Were you surprised to see that a big part of the defense's argument is that this guy gave false testimony and then it was relied upon by these jurors? Not at all, Ariva. He was their star witness. He was a centerpiece or the centerpiece, actually, of their case. And so what they highlighted um, in this motion is that um, that he testified falsely. That's huge coming from a, a government agent, again, who's the, the centerpiece of their case, that he claimed that he reviewed some 400,000 documents. But when it came to documents um, concerning Sebastian Ridley Thomas, he admitted that he had not read that, but somebody on his team would have. But he couldn't even say who that person on the team was, and that was never cured. Also, um, very significantly, a testimony alleging that um, a, a county official, Dr. Sharon, did not support the extension of the telehealth contract. There was no evidence to support that or that that was even true. In fact, they didn't 
um, they chose at the last minute to not call Dr. Sharon, who was there and who had been there for a certain amount of days, ready to testify. That would tend to, to show, uh, to indicate that they knew that, that these allegations um, were not true. Also, that he um, was um, untruthful about um, uh, Dr. Ridley Thomas threatening to cancel or rescind contracts. Uh, Ariva, there was absolutely no evidence to support that. And very um, masterfully, I will say that the um, the motion also says that it, it, it was uh, Atkins who created the pathway, and I'm quoting here, who created the pathway to infer that the telehealth contract was not genuine. And therefore, the jury could infer that this was something inappropriate, something that Dr. Riley Thomas had used to influence um, Marilyn Flynn. Okay, uh, Bobby, you heard what Dion said, that false allegations about testimony that one of the county witnesses would have given had he testified, but he didn't testify, no evidence that uh, he was influenced or that uh, Mark Riley Thomas used his uh, influence to pressure other uh, county supervisors. Now, does that start to rise to that level to something that could cause convictions to be reversed? Because now it's not ethics on the part of the lawyer or unethical conduct or crossing that line, but now you got an FBI agent sworn to tell the truth. And here's evidence that he didn't tell the truth. Does that concern you? Well, it's, it's definitely concerning, and it should be concerning to the prosecution any time that you would put on an FBI agent and the uh, FBI agent is being alleged to have lied on a witness. Stand. Obviously, that's concerning. Uh, in a trial, uh, I think um, everybody on the panel would agree that the jury uh, determines what the facts are. And, and oftentimes in argument and in moving papers after a trial, the defense will argue that somebody lied. Um, oftentimes judges, when reviewing this, and even on the appellate level, they'll look at it and say, well, this was a matter for the jury to determine who was telling the truth and who wasn't telling the truth. The bigger picture here is, did the prosecution prove to the federal legal standards what Mr. Ridley Thomas, uh, Dr. Ridley Thomas was actually guilty of and that seems to be the confusing uh, matter here that we've all been talking about you know from from day one in this case and especially after the verdict came in and we had that whole uh, conversation about what the jurors said afterwards that's the real debate here and i think you know once the parties get into court and start battling on that playing playing field that's where we're going to see some movement about whether this conviction will stand or whether a, a new motion will be granted because the issue is going to be, you know, and I think you're going to get into it is, you know, what was honest services? Was there a, a quid pro quo here? Did Dr. Ridley Thomas promise something uh, that he was in a po position to even do? Was the contract that we're talking about um, that was before the L.A. County Board of Supervisors, was that really a fait accompli, meaning that that was really already voted on, and so that wasn't something that he could promise or deliver uh, in any way in terms of, of value. So those are like the, the real key points here, and I think once the parties get to that, that's going to be the meat of potatoes of whether um, this case goes forward or not. The defense attorneys are saying that the prosecution knowingly presented false evidence and that they collaborated with the star witness in introducing that false testimony at trial and that all of the false testimony that was given was material now that's that's a that's a pretty big um issue that a judge is going to have to deal with is it likely that this judge will agree that, uh, that the prosecution knowingly presented false evidence? If you read these motions, you could easily come to that conclusion because the motions are very detailed. Uh, in in based on my experience, do I think that this motion could get uh, could get the uh, Mark Ridley Thomas to a point where the judge basically has to sit up straight and say, you know, maybe I did, I did, I did not conduct this trial with a tight enough 
a chain, a tight enough leash. Maybe I should not have, uh, uh, you know, passed on rulings that the defense was asking me to make at the time. Because what has happened is the defense in their motions, they're saying not only that was false testimony uh, was solicited and given, but they're also saying just the cumulative impacts of all of the discrepancies that the judge allowed to take place in the trial just denied Mark Thomas a, a fair trial. Uh, it does happen. Do I think that it could happen based on the, these two motions? Uh, these two motions certainly open up the, the doorway for that to happen. Yeah, and Bobby, one of the other big issues that's highlighted in both of these motions is the prosecution's failure to establish every element of the crime. Uh, and for instance, on the honest service fraud, they said basically they didn't present any motion and agenda, agenda item from the board. Uh, they didn't assert or present evidence that Mark Lee Thomas put pressure on other board members. And they really make a big deal out of the fact that they didn't meet their burden because they didn't call any county employees and their star witness acknowledged that he did not even understand the county process. They also make a big deal out of the fact that the motion on the telehealth contract was actually not a motion by Mark Lee Thomas, but one of his colleagues was second by one of his colleagues. So they're saying all of the elements to even establish these crimes wasn't met by the evidence presented by the prosecution. How persuasive do you think those arguments are? I'm very interested to see um, the comments that the judge makes in terms of finding evidence in the record that would support this conviction on all of the things that you just pointed out, Mariva. That's going to be really, very interesting. And it's going to take some work on the part of this judge to uh, present a cogent argument that there was evidence in the record on all of these different points. And I think that's um, that you've hit the nail on the head. That's the strongest um point that the defense is going to be able to make in these motions that they're going to bring uh, before the court. I think um, it is um, disturbing that a lot of this case seems to be based upon uh, the opinion of an FBI agent. Um, but I do think that a judge would likely say, well, the jury was made aware of the fact that the uh, witness was opining and giving uh, that his, his opinion on these matters. And so therefore the jury could have regarded it or disregarded it. Obviously um, that's the whole main point of the defense is that the judge should have never allowed that evidence to go to a jury. And as Mansfield points out, um, it'll be difficult for a judge to say, well, I made a mistake and I shouldn't have allowed that um, to go to the jury. And that's where the appellate courts come in. But I think in terms of uh, making arguments in front of this judge, that's gonna be the bigger point is, do, is there evidence in the record that supports this conviction? And can the judge find that evidence and um, present that evidence in her ruling as to whether the conviction should stand. 